Dr. Graham was talking about. I read the book. Quiet, wow. please. I can't hear. Sorry. Oh, That's my bomb bomb. 76 squared always ends in 76. This no matter what power is the, 76 is brought exactly to it, always ends in 76. She would be 76 is a... Man, is a Welcome to the book beat, Dialogues and Action. We have a very special guest here today. His name is uh, Dr. Arthur Graham, and he has a very uh, interesting background. He's a native of uh, Kingston, Jamaica. He became a U.S. citizen in 1963. He received his B.S. in accounting in 67 from San Diego State University and a Ph.D. in English and American Literature at the University of California, San Diego, in 1980. Pleasure to have you here, Dr. Graham. Thank you. All right. Uh, a very interesting book titled Mercy Seat, in which you do an analysis of the Schindler's List. Right. Uh, why don't you give the viewers out there a little more background on yourself, for example. What was your dissertation on? Uh, well, the dissertation is a background to what this a particular a new paradigm represents. In other words, Schindler's List as uh, a movie review is just more, is more than a coverage, just a regular coverage. It does take into consideration aspect of race in terms of color, form, sound, and motion. Those uh, four creative elements then comprise the tetranalysis, that's the new paradigm that, uh, or approach that was used to analyze the movie Schindler's all right, List. All right, you might be losing some of the viewers out there because they might be saying, what is Schindler's List? Give them a little uh, well, backdrop uh, on basically what is Schindler's List? Well, we, uh, well uh, I do uh, work with uh, image analysts, all media services, and we have uh, developed uh, a technique for reviewing movies, other work of art, and so forth, and it is an ongoing business, and as such, we were invited to see Schindler's List, along with several minority people from the community, on February 10th, I think it was, in, in 1994, at uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Okay. And uh, as, through that invitation, then, uh, I went right ahead and did and applied that new method to Schindler's List as the first piece of work by itself to use that techniques to, un uh, to, to uh, analyze movie in terms of how minorities are portrayed. We want to say, are they portrayed in a positive sense or in a negative sense? And this all has to do with racism, uh, the type of things that we've been complaining about for some times, but we have not an approach that would give us the insight that we need to see how these cinematic details, what they had up to. Uh, essentially, then, we had come up with, the, as I said before, the tetranalysis, which is a four-part uh, category of form, color, sound, and motion. Now, this takes in, in cinematic terms, what, is, what you're seeing in terms of the motion of characters, and characters, you might say, uh, the dominant character or the minor character, 
how they compare with each other throughout the whole Now, now wait a minute. It, it may be some viewers out there that saying that, well, movie industry is strictly for entertainment. Is that a fact or, or is that fiction? Uh, that is part of the truth. You know, it is also for education. And at times, the type of ed education and entertainment we've been having uh, more or less distorts minority images. And so uh, when you talk about Schindler's List, for example, you say that, uh, well, there are no minorities in this movie. There are no right. black people in this movie. But the color-coded devices that are used in this movie, it, it might as well be black. In other words, for example, what are some examples of that? Uh, well, we have uh, uh, the black dog that appeared in there. You know, uh, uh, and the, what it, was that it, symbolic it, 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 Well, the, the blackness is more or less used around as a terror device and to use anything black in color or form, which is, say, form a person or uh, a dog, any, any animal, person, or even uh, a car. You might see a black or a yellow car or what have you. These objects are placed strategically in the movie uh, at moments when you have increasing terror, uh, you have somebody's going to die or something terrible is going to happen. Uh, these points in the story, you see blackness appear. Now, wait a minute. It's, it's, it's a black and white movie now. Well, that's part of it. Uh, the whole history of black and white movie was to use blackness and whiteness in, in, a, in a certain degree of uh, terror uh, where you see gray. You don't see you always just say black and white, but leading up to those points when you have a terrible situation, you would see the black comes on the screen. Uh, this is one reason, for example, why uh, most people do not want to go back and have colorations of movie that were done originally in black and white. It would throw off the effect of the terror, the organization of the terror line in terms of this simple color colorific uh, uh, sense of black and white, say, to, say, move from gray to extreme black, and then you see whatever befalls the, the hero or the villain something terrible happened after that. Now you're saying that someone or the producer or whatever... Uh, well, it's much more than that, all right? Because that's where the, 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 my dissertation, the research comes in uh, from the Manichaean light motif that I did at UCSD. It actually cracked the racist code of how uh, 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 racism is structured in the language. And it gets very deep into the aesthetics around these particular elements. And it was done in poetry, especially in a novel. Uh, it really came out of religious writings. Uh, you talk about spirit ascending and descending, and those particular movements have certain uh, thematic meaning to them. When you see a character ascending a stairs, for example, or descending a stairs. And in Schindler's List, incidentally, it opens with you see a uh, uh, a, a Jewish person at the time of the onset of persecution uh, descending a spiraling staircase. Which is symbolic of what? Right. The movement itself was like you're going into hell. You're going to see terrible things occurring. And these are cinematic things that people learn, but they pick up these notion of motion and so forth from earlier aesthetic forms. Is this like back with Birth of a Nation and uh, Griffin and now? And from that mindset, what does that derive from? Uh, well, it all, it, you're, in a, you're in a profession where people develop art forms and conventions. And a convention has it where if we want to show terror, we would show uh, or associate uh, the increase in terror through a yellow person or yellow before you get the black, and then a black person or whatever. In this sense, you might have a yellow cab. So you always find people using yellow cabs or yellow cars oh, in the I, scenes. I got some viewers out there that's probably saying, uh, how was this report received? Did they think you're just some paranoid individual that went into watch this movie Schindler's List and then just thought that you would attack uh, the Holocaust in the sense? What was the reaction to the study that, you, that was done on the movie? Well, le let me go back and say, mention uh, in terms of the color configuration. We had one scene in there where you see a black statue, all right? That was at, uh, what we termed the, the, the European blackened uh, Venus. And it was put into the movie at a time when the German soldier was about to commit a, a, a rape or brutal crime in one of the Jewish uh, 
uh, ladies that uh, were in the camp, was in the camp. Uh, at this particular time then, we wonder why is that color given to the statue? Why is it all black? Right. And it get, again, it fits into a pattern that has been established in the use of color, again, to create terror. So when we study the, the, the when we isolate uh, these elements and bring them all back together in terms of the theme of the, theme of the movie, what is being said and what have you, we can determine that uh, uh, color was used in the same respect as if they had black people in them. And again, the various behavior patterns of the act actors, the Jewish people playing uh, uh, Polish Jews, their behavior were uh, more or less like demeaning and stereotypical as what you would might see in Gone with the Wind or Birth of a Nation. It was to show a kind of slave mentality or a, a, a subjugated type people. So we wonder then what were the writers doing and the filmmakers doing? What were they drawing on as model or examples mm -hmm. to project this a, a, a lower s sense of being under oppression or what have you. And then we don't really uh, see what the actual story is behind the German Jew experience so in Poland. So what was that prototype that they've drawn from? Well, we don't see it. We mostly see people being railroaded or pushed around from railroad cars to railroad cars or soldiers pushing guns and we wonder what really went on uh, in, uh, in Poland at the time that caused this conflict confrontation between the, the Jews and the Germans. We don't usually get uh, the human stories. We get symbolic stories okay. in order to sell something that is entertaining and is brutal and violent. And so we're not fooled by what some symbolic thing is saying about a particular event. We also study the history behind, uh, say, the German people and the Jewish people to try to say, well, let's get some balance in there. All right, All right. Now, I got a quote from Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. I, don't, I didn't th even think that film could be powerful enough to reach beyond the popcorn barrel and get people to change the way they think about the world. I've always sort of left that to the novelists, the essay writers, and the professors. Yeah. Is that a true statement? Well, I, I kind of took a little heat on that because I might answer to all three categories, all right? And it, uh, I smile about it because I think he was, that was just before he received the Academy Award. And uh, of course he was getting the acclaim and he was uh, about to take the movie around uh, the Jewish Center, the Simon Weisenthal Center, uh, again invited us to come there to see the movie. Mm -hmm. And the movie then, it is used beyond a movie, beyond entertainment, okay. beyond education, or it might be called education, but in this sense it becomes a piece of propaganda. You have to go around and tell people to watch the movie, take it to black people in particular. But don't all uh, people that produce movies do that? No, Isn't I that don't, sort of I like part of the... Uh, I, the, I don't uh, think so. And the more people are aware of what this movie contain in terms of these images, in terms of this particular analysis, they would raise as much hell as they did when Birth of a Nation was projected upon us, when it was given to us as a story of what America is. And of course, we know the history of the NAACP, another organization uh, protesting, and we have done that over the years. We just now are more efficient in terms of the tools or this particular paradigm as a tool for analyzing these things to see what is really behind it. So now, uh, now why did you give it the title, The Mercy Seat? Uh, the Mercy Seat, then, is, is very involved in terms of the whole cycle of of the Jewish faith. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament in the third uh, chapter in this book, I have a typology where I projected or I presented passages from the New Testament and the Old Testament and say, well, one is a type of the other. You can look at it either way. Right. If you're of the Jewish faith, you might not think Jesus is your savior, whereas if you're a Christian, you might say Jesus is our mercy seat. As a matter of fact, some Christians say Jesus is our mercy seat. Oh, right. Now, what has been the reaction to the book? Uh, the reaction has been tremendous. I've uh, gotten the invitation. As I'm, that's one reason why I'm here. It's uh, mainly word to word. word uh, you know, we don't have a, it's a small publisher, mm -hmm. uh, the book tree in Glendale, uh, publisher, uh, Mr. Willie, Paul Willie. Mm -hmm. And we've been taking it around to small bookstores such as SO1 
and he has a certain circuit that he has, and he uh, and and it's, it's a, a matter that being so small, we don't have the wherewithal to let everybody know about it. Oh, but the, the reception has been what, good. What did the museum think of it? Uh, Wiesenthal, the place where you viewed the movie, eh? you watched the show. Right. Did you send them a copy? Did uh, you say anything to them to let them know that there's some liminal messages in this film? Uh, well, we tried working with uh, the first time that uh, the tetranalysis was demonstrated as a critical tool uh, was in a report that Sarita Coffey, president at, uh, of Image Analyst All Media Services, my partner, and I did for the Los Angeles branch NWACP. Mm -hmm. That was in 1992. Yes. And we took that report around and we tried to uh, reach all the major uh, professional organizations, including uh, the Academy of, this, of uh, Arts and Science people. We went over there, uh, we presented them the report, and re the result was devastating. We were treated as if, you know, nothing really matters, that what we had to say was of, to no avail, right. And so we want to let them see. We don't, I'm not particularly concerned about going to the establishment in that sense and knocking on the door, and they keep forever thinking that uh, African American doesn't have something to say about. No, no, it, it may be some on. viewers, listeners out there, viewers that are saying that uh, there's a lot of negative uh, black movies out there. I mean, take for example, uh, In Living Color, that won a uh, NAACP Image Award. Uh, well, we have. You know, I mean, it's. All right, <laughs> we're in a we're in a very uh, trying moment now, where we talk about a new paradigm again. Okay. You have information that people use, say, in critical review. Uh, you talk about a theme or a character or what have you. Mm -hmm. You have the same movie. We see the same movie, yet you might look at Schindler's List and say, how did they see something that I didn't see? Right, right. So the challenge is there. We're saying, uh, you get the book, see our tapes, see, hear what we have to say, and view for yourself. And then when you come back, see if what we're saying is what actually is going on that probably you didn't recognize before because the approach was a Eurocentric point of view. You were promoting the hero, you were all for the hero, you weren't thinking about the minority people, the Asians and the black and so forth that were presented in these movies. You get caught up in the listening of what they're saying, how they're coming along, but this particular approach will allow you to, to pause, look at everything else, look at the storyline, uh, look at what the characters are actually saying with each other, but then you come a, a, a back to a comparative point of view where you look at the minorities in reference to these things, and then you begin to see where the positive and negative uh, portrayals really begin to separate uh, what is now, going on. Now, will this book uh, bridge the relationships between Jews and blacks, or will it uh, further divide them? Where, where, where does this book fall at when you, when you put it out there and it stands up? Well, let's go back to the typology about uh, the, the mercy seat, the, the point you asked me about, the, the meaning of the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a scene in Schindler's List where the German goth is after they caught him. And that's the main character. Right, the, the devil. He's uh, like the devil. Uh, don't forget that uh, Schindler's List is advertised as an epic. And when you say epic, you start dealing with very deep subject matter, like perhaps in, say, Milton's Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. You talk about the force of goodness or darkness or the devil and what mm -hmm. have you. And by their own word, uh, they claim that this movie is an epic, so it has to be taken seriously to see the structural, mythical uh, uh, symbolism in the movie that is not too readily apparent, for so example. So you don't consider him a hero? Uh, well, ooh, goth? Yeah. No, I wouldn't say he's a hero, but I'm saying he's, he's made to, to uh, parallel the hero as the devil. The hero, is, uh, of course, is Schindler. And you have Goth, who is uh, playing the villain. Yes. And so his role becomes very large, larger than himself. And much, much is placed on Goth to carry the burden of the whole German army, in some cases, even of the whole German people. And that is not really, that's a kind of one-sided picture of what really went on. Uh, any human being, uh, that takes another human being's life in a sense or whatever in that sense. We, we wouldn't call him a hero. Right. We wouldn't say he's a great person. All we want to say is that if you're going to show the movie and you're going to make it violent and dramatic and you go back to these patterns of seeing things and putting colors there, 
you put a black statue in there, you put a black dog in there, you have incidentally Billie Holiday's voice singing a song at a particular moment when a little girl in red dress is about to get killed. So music plays a role in this also. That's part of the yeah, sound. Music and sound is is a sound in especially with black people's music. Uh, they, they've used black people's music at, at these instances as lead motif sounds to underscore terror and death. And so you don't see any black in there as such, but the, 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 the roles are projected as black and color is put in the same sense as they would if black people were in there. And particularly in this case, then we talk about Billie Holiday's voice. Now, you back to the mercy seat mm -hmm. point. Uh, the title itself is important in a sense that if it's an epic story and it, it draws our attention to a more deeper reflection of what the movie is saying. And since we're professional people, we're not just writing an average re report. We're, okay. we're, we're going in there and getting every detail that you could so think about. So you're more about. than just a film critic. Right. It, 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 is a, it, it is a more serious piece of writing than just that. That's why, it, of, of course, we put it in book form. Now, The Mercy Seat, then, the title came from passages in the Old Testament, I think in Leviticus, uh, one of these uh, passages, 16, um, I hope I'm not misquoting myself okay. here, but anyway, uh, uh, he was being hung, okay? And at the time he was placed upon a chair and in the, uh, a stool and it, it was kicked out from under his foot. And when I saw that, it, it, it immediately hit me that that's probably the main thematic thing about that, that uh, uh, the mercy seat in terms of the Jewish old calendar, of the you have the feast, you have the Sabbath, you have the seven, uh, 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 the seven year, you have the fifth year, mm -hmm. you have the feast of the tabernacle and whatever, the old cycle of uh, feasts and so forth that celebrates the, 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 the year. And around that then the, the, the question of the mercy seat is that gold plate that is placed upon the Ark of the Covenant, all right? And it does reflect something about uh, mercy, justice, and so forth that within an epic sense you have to consider these uh, uh, mythical structures in the work. It gets involved then, that's why I put these things in there to say reflect on what you see, go back and look at the biblical passages that this story might be, this movie might be saying to us. Now when you get into the New Testament you find that the life of Jesus, Jesus himself uh, rent that particular way of seeing the world as far as worshiping, you know, as far as uh, uh, going into the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and these deeper analysis, that that wouldn't be a point where you would see, for example, uh, Schindler going into the Catholic Church and you wonder why is he there? Okay. All right, is there a real connection between the Catholic Church and what the Germans were doing, right or wrong? Mm. And recently we hear the Pope, for example, uh, 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 admitted that uh, they, the, the church played some kind of role in, in what happened to the Jewish people in Germany. That it wasn't as what the movie make of it and what reality makes okay. of it. That's our responsibility as critics to bring a focus back into play, to look at the real history behind something and look at the presentation of that history in cinematic terms. All right, now you take on another movie too, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, and that you dissect that in many ways too. Well, we did that. We did that. Uh, Sarita Coffey uh, initially went out and made those selections. Uh, she worked, of course, with me at Image Analyst. And she was the first person to apply my theory to tetraanalysis. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a movie critic herself. And so she, was a, she had an experience extended tool to go out there and, and see what is happening and incidentally uh, that worked well for me to, sh to see that somebody else can, it can take the theory and apply it and, and, and uh, of course she looked at uh, Silence of the Lamb and we reviewed it after she went out there and, and, and selected these movies. Now has any directors of um, Hollywood of anywhere approach you to ask you a question that I'm getting ready to make this movie and I want to make it right Right. We have we have people who have uh, uh, I have writers. Uh, at, at first, it was difficult for people to think that anyone want to know what racism is before they're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Someone would say, "Well, <laughs> you know, nobody's going to pay you 
for telling us what we want to do anyway. Right. And I say that's bunk because you still come back to the question you asked at first. Is it entertainment? Is it education? Whatever it is, it's a dollar. If, you, right. if people don't come and see it, you're not going to achieve what you set out to do. And people want information. They want ratings. They want to know what the content of a movie is. They want intelligent appraisal of what something is before they go and see something or send their children to see it or what have you. And in this particular case with Schindler's List, it is a grave concern with the African-American community because we have this Jewish, uh, some like Farrakhan type thing going yeah. on and uh, people saying all kinds of things. It seems like the media plays up on this. Yes. And we need to put that aside and let's examine something for what it is. So my analysis of this movie wasn't about a political thing in a sense. However, we do find that the movie itself is a propaganda tool. And I right. was helping. Right. Okay. Well, I don't know about that. The, the, not, not the movie industry as such, but Schindler's List, according to what I did with uh, the Mercy Seat, uh, I did come and say that, you know, it is uh, an instrument of propaganda for what it sets oh, out to do. One for, well, what's the movie that you would recommend? Sweet, Sweet Back. Sweet, Sweet Back. Badass song. A classic. You can't even I find can't, it. Believe me, you won't find it. You know, th then you get to say, well, when you look at it, you say, well, here's a degenerate person who's doing so on, so on. He's having these illicit sex, and it's a B movie and what have you. I met Van Peebles myself, and I congratulated for him. I think he's a genius. The, the point is that you have people suffering, and you have police brutality. We talk about the O.J. Simpson thing going on now. Yes. I recall in San Diego when I was a student at San Diego State, the police came up and beat me up and took me to jail because I was living in the wrong neighborhood. And they tried to put more charges on me, so I, I'm, I become, to us. you know, uh, initiated in, in what the police might do to a black man. Well, here was a black man then, Sweetback, who was a nothing, mm -hmm. and the police was abusing a brethren and he stopped to help the brethren. That, that's the essence of, of right. that story. Not the fact that he was a de degenerate, because even if you are a degenerate in any religion, you can rise above the level where you are, you know, once you get the spirit in you or whatever. And that, in that sense to me, that, that the theme of the movie was something that was never well, done before. What's the movie we can see? You're not even a movie. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I want to get historical, all right? Okay. To, to, to mention Sweetback, to, to, to talk about the hero in a sense. Now. You, you, you talked earlier about black movies and uh, if they are aware, the writers and the right. actors, and I would say most often our own writers learn from the conventions. Sort of, of writing, miseducation right. in a sense. They go to USC or UCLA or wherever they go to school and like myself, I go and I read uh, uh, within, the, within the mainstream traditional work. All right, how about Menace to Society? Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. I think Sarita has, all right? But what we're trying to say is that uh, we did have a few report uh, in the NAACP report that had to do with black movies. And for the most part, uh, as to conventions, most of these people follow along the European conventions, okay. and well, they're not aware one, of what they're doing. Here's one for you. Every, if you haven't, Ma oh, wait, Malcolm X, the movie. Uh, Malcolm X. Uh, did you see it? Yeah, I saw Malcolm X, and here was an uh, instance where people who know about my work, they were trying to get me connected with uh, Spike, Spike Lee. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Lee doesn't want to see anybody about it. That's the tragic part about African American as far as what we're doing. Uh, you, know, you take a, a movie like Schindler's List and you get all kind of experts right. get involved. But uh, we don't have access to each other uh, to know about what we're doing in order to say how can we help or participate in making this movie what it should be. And I think it got a little historical distortion, for example. There's a scene where in the prison, Malcolm is being, uh, a, a, he has a vision, uh, apparition right. of uh, Elijah Muhammad. Right. Right. Uh, in the autobiography, Malcolm said that it was fraud, master fraud Muhammad, uh, a master fraud that he saw, not uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad. Now, you can't make those, you know, for cinematic reasons, you can't shorten things uh, like all that. Right, all right, Jay. Yeah. It was this time of season where you're out watching a movie. I think most of you out there that watch the book Beat Dialogues in Action, 
to check out this book, The Mercy Seat, by Dr. Arthur Graham. And the next time you go to the movies, see how many subtle effects you can find, okay? Well, Thank I you for him, being here. I urge him to get the book, and then it's much more easier to follow along. All right. Thank you. Thank you.